Welcome to Non-Gendered Fitness, where we explore health, fitness, transitioning, and queer life from beyond the binary. Proudly brought to you by Fearless Movement Collective, the home of queer fitness and health. And here's your host, Bowie Stobar. Hi there, welcome to Non-Gendered Fitness. This is episode one. My name is Bowie Stover. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm stoked to have you join me. Before we jump in, I do want to acknowledge that this show is recorded on the stolen lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Sovereignty never was and never will be ceded. I pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. So this episode, we're going to be looking into non-medical transition pathways, specifically physical activity and how it can be used to support and connect your heart, body and mind. So by the end of the episode, I'm hoping that you will have gained an understanding of what it means to transition, learn a bit about what medical and non-medical transitioning is and how to use physical activity as a non-medical transition pathway. The transitioning is the act of changing yourself physically and that can be done through surgical options like top surgery or bottom surgery by taking hormones or it can be done socially by changing your name, changing your pronouns, the clothes you wear, the way that you move your body so many different ways but it's simply in the space of the transgender diverse community transitioning is uh, I would like to think an evolution of going from the person that you may have had to live as to survive and stay safe to becoming the person that is your authentic self and then expressing that so there are so many ways a person can transition and they are all valid Before we go any further, I do want to acknowledge the amount of gatekeeping that can happen and lateral violence that occurs within the trans and gender diverse community when it comes to a person's transition. So transitioning is such an individual experience and no two transitions are the same and there is absolutely no wrong way to do it and you don't even have to transition if you don't want to. You can be trans or you can be gender diverse and you don't have to make any changes at all to yourself physically or socially to be valid as a trans or gender diverse person. <sighs> I had to say that because it's something that I see occurring so often. I've been on the receiving end of attacks from people who have told me that my transition is invalid because I am choosing to transition non-medically using physical activity, using personal development to become my authentic self. And I've been told by people from the trans community that that doesn't make me valid because I'm not struggling with dysphoria, because I'm not wanting to start hormones, because I'm not wanting surgeries. That doesn't make me trans or it doesn't make me gender diverse. And I just want to say to everyone out there who has experienced that, don't listen to that shit. That is not true. You do you. However, the plop you want to do you and no one can tell you otherwise. We get enough uh, and we get enough attacks from outside of our own community, let alone having people from within it trying to say what you can and can't do to fit their view of what it means to be trans or gender diverse. If someone tells you that you're doing it wrong, you tell them to fuck right off because you do it how you want to do it and they do it how they want to do it. And both ways are valid. But what we don't need is people coming in and judging someone else's lived experience and their own actions. Okay. (laughs) Thank you for that. I just want to be really clear that this is something that's really quite toxic in our community and it needs to change because we need to support each other. We're not going to get anywhere by infighting and by judging each other. So when we look at transition pathways, I did touch on medical transitioning and non-medical transitioning, but I'm going to go a little bit further into that right now. So medical transition pathways, you've got a couple of options, whether you're someone who was assigned female at birth, transitioning to male, or someone who was assigned male at birth and transitioning to female. Uh, Your options are hormones and your options are surgeries if you're pursuing a medical avenue. And they involve making physiological changes to your body through the use of testosterone or estrogen with hormones or through surgeries that will either 
remove a person's chest if they have experienced a female puberty or augment their chest and add implants if they are someone who has experienced a male puberty. There's also bottom surgery and in various forms depending on the assumed sex at birth was of a person and also kind of how they want their uh, lower genitals to actually present to the world or not the world oh my gosh well I guess if you want to present to the world no judgment that is all you and you rock that how you want to and there's nothing wrong with wanting to do that if that is the case but the way that you want to have your body body just outwardly present Uh, when it comes to non-medical transition pathways there are a bunch more kind of avenues and they are often much more accessible than medical avenues so the thing with medical transitioning is it requires lots of Lots of doctor's visits, pathologizing of your identity, wait lists, so many wait lists. And I will not in any way say that there is anything wrong with medical transitioning. It is life-saving. I truly, truly believe that medical transitioning saves lives of people within the trans and gender diverse community. And I will always fully support any person who is courageous enough to take those steps to do what they need to do to live authentically. However, at the same time, there is a lot of pathologizing of trans and gender diverse identities that is often associated with medical transition pathways. And I don't think that's our fault. That's the medical industry. That's the doctors. That's the general population who view us as as people who have a problem or a disorder. We're not just, or it's not classified as that anymore, but it was, right? So that view has shaped the whole approach that the medical industry has when it comes to people who live a trans and gender diverse experience. Now, non-medical transition pathways are things like changing your name, changing the clothes you wear, changing the way you walk, changing the way you talk. You can change the way your body appears by chest binding, by packing, you know, adding something to the front of your jocks to make it look like you've got a bulge there, by tucking where you kind of tuck things back so it looks like you don't have a bulge there. So many different options and a lot of the time they can be much more accessible, a bit easier to start with and just as affirming, just as affirming as medical avenues and definitely very often they are used in in support of medical avenues. So it's important to look at all the options available before we decide to transition. You see, we have a choice. We can choose how we want to be, how we want to be seen, how we want to present. And we can take steps to fulfill that. And from my own experience, physical activity was life-changing for me. It was life-saving for me. It was one of the most affirming things that I could ever have done. As I touched on in episode zero, I grew up in regional Queensland, Australia. For those of you who don't know much about Queensland as a state, it is hyper-conservative, really redneck. (laughs) If you're not cis, if you're not white, and if you're not male, Shit gets a bit hard and when I lived up there, I did not feel safe to express the questions that I had about my gender identity. So I lived openly as a lesbian for quite a long time and even then copped a real hard time for it. Quite a lot of confrontations, both verbal and physical, was an occurrence that I've had since I was about eight years old. So it was rough, (laughs) but... Three and a half years ago, I moved to Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, and it changed my life. And I was able to language the experience that I had been having for my whole life. See, when I lived in Queensland, I didn't have anyone to talk to. I didn't have a support network. I didn't have either medical or just in a friend circle, people who I thought would be able to understand my experience. And it got me real down. And I had this idea in my head about who I wanted to be. And it was someone who looked athletic, who looked fit. And at the time, I did not look like that. I had a really unhealthy relationship with alcohol. And it was just a gin generally a hard time. Until I started playing roller derby, one of the most glorious sports you will ever participate in. And met an amazing human who was on my team, who actually was a kettlebell coach and a personal trainer. And they asked me to come along and train with them. And it changed my life. They told me 
that they thought I'd make an amazing fitness coach. So the next day I went out and signed up for my certification and that started my journey, not only uh, to becoming a personal trainer, but also in learning that I could express my internal identity by shaping my body. And it has been a challenge. It has not been a fast journey. Um, I think that real change does take time regardless of what that is and not just in a physical space, but just in, in general in life. Real change takes time. And I've been training for over six years now to reach the point where I'm at, where I feel like how I present outwardly really aligns with who I am inside. Physical activity can be a great way to kind of start making change in your life pretty immediately. Whereas, as I touched on earlier, when if it comes to pursuing medical avenues, it can take quite a lot of time. And I know down here in Melbourne that the affirming doctors that are around, they are packed. They are packed to the broom and they have wait lists for like 12 or 18 months in some cases just to get in and see a person, but to start looking at what avenues it's possible to pursue. It can be really challenging and it can get people down because it's like, oh, well, I want to I wanna transition. I want to start shaping change in my life, but I've got to wait. And so it's kind of like things get put on hold for them. It's like, well, I can't feel fulfilled in myself until I've started my transition. And my transition has to wait 12 months. But it's like, no friend, it does not have to. Because you could start moving your body however you are able to almost immediately. And it will begin to shape change in your life. Physical activity does not shape change quickly, as I said, but let's look at it this way. If you are on a wait list because you want to medically transition, then what you could do, say you've got a 12-month wait list, you could spend the next 12 months moving your body, connecting with your body, exploring how else you want to express yourself and how else you can express yourself so that by the time your appointment comes up and you're able to go and speak to the specialist about what you want to do, whether you want to start hormones, whether you want to look into surgeries, your body is already in a space where it's moving towards where you want to be. It's forward movement and it can be such a great experience because there's nothing worse than being stuck, feeling like someone else is controlling your options. I mean, you have the ability to control your own options and physical activity supports all transition pathways. It doesn't matter if it's medical. It doesn't matter if it's non-medical. It is one of the best ways that you can start to do something positive for you. See, if you're someone who will start hormones, let's say you start uh, testosterone. The thing is, testosterone does a lot of things to the body. It redistributes fat. And same with estrogen, actually. like There's a lot of fat redistribution that goes on, a lot of change that happens in the body. Ligaments and tendons will thicken. If you're on T, if you started taking estrogen, then you're going to lose a bit of muscle mass, which also runs the risk of lessening your bone density as well. The physical activity can help support these changes. And when I've had, I've had some conversations with a few guys I know who have been on tea and they're like, oh, no, I'm on tea now. Like, I'm full of energy. I'm so hungry all the time, though. I just can't stop eating, you know, but I know I'm going to get strong. It's like, yeah, well, yes, friend, you will get strong. However, let's use some cis guys as an example. Just because there is testosterone in their body does not naturally mean they will build muscle. There are a lot of overweight cis men out there. And that is because... <laughs> You do need physical activity in conjunction with testosterone to really start developing the lean muscle mass that you may be looking for. Physical activity is also a great one for people who are preparing for top surgery or not only that, just people who want to have a smaller chest. I know for myself, training actually helped reduce the size of my chest like by a whole bunch to the point where like I wear a binder, but I can also get away with wearing just a sports crop and my chest looks pretty flat. So it's a bit of a, a bit of a neat perk there. You can actually train your chest down quite a bit because it turns out your chest holds quite a bit of soft tissue. So if you have... Um, excess soft tissue, one of the places that it's really commonly stored in people who were assumed female at birth is in their chest. So hooray for being able to train away some of that before you would go in for top surgery. But the other perk is that if you're doing physical activity and developing some muscle mass in your chest, it actually can help the surgeons get a more natural looking chest and not really need so much contouring because you do already have some muscle mass there. And it means that once you've had top surgery, you're already going to have some rad pecs to show off. You know, hooray, hooray for kind of instant pec chest. 
that's pretty rad. I do want to point out that physical activity is really great for people who chest bind as well because what it can do is actually give you the ability to move your body better because chest binding is quite quite compressive. It, it restricts the ribs from stretching so when we breathe and you're binding it actually makes it a bit harder it has some pretty pretty direct implications on you kind of your thoracic spine or kind of from about the bottom of your rib, rib cage up to the tops of your shoulder blades that whole area has some pretty direct impacts on that area of your back which in general can not feel great <laughs> speaking from personal experience it can it can be quite limiting and it particularly it affects the way that you breathe because it's not allowing your ribs to expand and when we can't breathe properly I mean expand through our diaphragm which is like the little bit of muscle that separates um, our breathing organs our heart and lungs from our stomach organs kind of sits in there and it's that it's a barrier but it helps us breathe yeah <laughs> um, but when we when we are binding and our ribs are compressed, we actually breathe. You can breathe high in your chest and breathing high in your chest means that you're breathing quite shallow and that creates tension. You can get a lot of neck and shoulder tension and muscle tension and shallow breathing leads to an elevated heart rate, which increases anxiety. It's like this really hectic little flow on effect there. So if you are someone who is prone to anxiety and you're also someone who chest binds, you may want to just check out or observe how you're breathing and how that feels and look at what your other options are. I will be sharing a neat little breathing exercise later on in the show for people who do chest bind and do find that they are someone who may breathe kind of high in their chest because you can definitely use physical activity to support your chest binding so that your body just feels better in general. So how can you begin to add movement to your day? Well, one thing I want to point out is it's always important to work within your abilities and start small. One of the things I see so often is people who will start getting active and they want to jump straight in and they might do a week and in that week they absolutely smash themselves and then they're sore or they get injured because you've kind of started beyond your abilities. What I've found is that it's so much better to start physical activity and kind of just gradually work your way in. You've got to start at your level. I know, and I've been guilty of this myself, is thinking, oh my God, I want to start training. I'm going to do this thing and this thing and this thing. It's going to be great. I'm going to be intense. I'm a warrior. Ah!" Well, I mean, not everyone thinks like that, but I know when I started, I was kind of like that. I've learned a lot of tough lessons over the the, the um, handful or so years that I have since been participating in physical activity. And what I have learned is that start small and listen to your body and don't listen to people who tell you that you need to train hard. Don't listen to the inspirational quotes that blab on about no pain, no gain or, you know, train hard or go home or like whatever ridiculous quotes that talk about pushing your body to beyond a reasonable limit and thinking that you're going to actually make progress like that. Because it doesn't work like that because you need to know that the results of training don't come from the training session. The results you get from training come from how well you recover. I'm going to say that again. The results you get from training don't come from the training session. They come from how well you recover. It's your muscles healing that makes growth. It's not the training session. Yes, the training session creates the tiny little micro tears in your muscle tissue But it's those muscle tears healing that creates muscle growth, right? It's recovery. And it's something that people don't get told. And it blows my mind. Like the fitness industry doesn't tell you this. It's not training hard. It's recovering hard. That's where you get change. That's where you shape real change that's actually going to have a positive impact on your life. Because if you want to go into a session and like do high intensity interval training or CrossFit, and don't get me wrong, there are people out there, they are mad for that. And they love it and it works for them. However, long term, it's not sustainable. Over time, your body can't maintain continued high intensity activity. At some point, you're going to overtrain, you're going to get injured. You know, it might, yeah, you might be able to do it for a handful of years even, but long term, it's just not something that's sustainable and overall beneficial for your body. What you want to do 
is start where you're able to start at and start by getting movement into your body through mobility. So it's not about adding load or lifting weights straight away. Before you start that, you've got to make sure you've got a strong base. And a strong base starts with your body being able to move well, with you being able to breathe well. Because if you can't breathe, you can't put load like weights onto your body and expect it to hold up. That's how you get injured. And it's how I've seen so many people get taught to train. And then they wonder why five or six months later, they've busted their knee or they've busted their shoulder. It's because they had a limitation in their body to start with. Something didn't move right. So something else compensated. And over time, they strengthened an area that was then working in a way that it should not have. And all of a sudden, their whole body seems to just be one injury after the other. So you want to start small and don't think that it's going to be perfect straight away. You're not going to get you know, every session in every time. And that's okay. Moving when you can, how you can, is going to have more benefit than thinking, I'm going to train six times this week and then training three times, being really tired, really worn out, and then beating yourself up about the other three times that you didn't get a session in. That's worse for your body than not training at all. Because what we think has an impact on our body and how it functions. So when I talk about getting started and starting small and starting by mobilizing your body, what I'm talking about is is mobility exercises, is body weight movements. And there's a really great one that I want to share with you today. Uh, One of the reasons being because I spoke about chest binding and the importance of that. And this is a movement that's also really great for people who spend a lot of time sitting. So if you're sitting at a computer all day for work or you sit down, like if you're a gamer or anything like that, sitting is something that can really limit how our bodies move. So there's a really great movement that's for the thoracic spine, which is that that kind of bottom of the rib to top of the shoulder blade section that I talked about. And it's called a bretzel. The name is bizarre, I know. It is because it is a movement that you you lay on the ground for, you're kind of on your side, you've got your legs twisted one way, your upper body twisted the other way, and you kind of look a little bit like a pretzel. And I'm pretty sure it was invented by a guy named Brett. So, of course, the very original naming scheme that came from that was Bretzel. (laughs) I had one client who always called it Brexit, which I found a bit funny because it's like, we're going to do Bretzels now. And they're like, oh, Brexit. It's like, no, we're not leaving the European Union. We're just going to hop on the floor and stretch. (laughs) So, So it is a Bretzel. I will link a video to the Bretzel in the show notes. And I would recommend jumping in, having a look at this video, and then just doing it maybe twice, twice this week or twice in the next seven days. Just It's a cool time to do it in the morning when you first get up. You can do it while you're already in bed because sometimes laying on a bed, well, not sometimes, laying on a bed is generally more comfortable than laying on the floor to do a thing. But if you are someone like myself who does like to just lay on the floor and do things on the floor, do it on the floor. Totally cool as well. And it's essentially a movement that is going to help open up not only your thoracic spine, but also across the front of your chest. And this is really important for people who chest spine because it's really common to kind of get a bit of a slouched, shoulders rounded, pulled forward kind of shape. And the bretzel really helps to not only get movement through your back, but also get movement through your chest. It is a very cool move. I will be linking sh- linking to that in the show notes. You'll get a video. I'll be explaining when to do it, how to do it. Just try it. Trust me. Trust me. Do it a few times. Do it uh, you know, twice in the next seven days. If you can, do it three times the week after that and slowly, just a few times a week, add it to your morning and see how much change that makes. Now, if you are someone who does have back problems, I would recommend talking to your whoever your allied health professional is that may support you in that. Have a chat with them first to make sure it's safe because one thing I would not want is someone to try something if they've got a compromised spine in some way that could lead to further injury. We definitely don't want that. If you are someone who is not able to move in certain ways, then an alternative that you can do is to start with deep breathing. 
I mentioned earlier that breathing with our diaphragms is really important. It has a a lot of really positive implications when it comes to reducing anxiety. It's like deep breathing is pretty much meditation. It's like breathing and and kind of inhaling fully and you don't have to focus on the breath. That makes it, I think that's what makes it meditation if you like focus on the breath, but it's kind of hard not to when you're thinking about (laughs) breathing a little bit deeper. It kind of automatically you'll start thinking about how you're breathing. Now, I will also be linking a video to a deep breathing exercise that you can do in the show notes as well. If you're struggling with that, I have a third and final suggestion for you that if you want to start shaping some immediate change in your life, I could recommend getting between seven and nine hours of sleep every night. Sleep is one of the most underrated activities and possibly for most people, one of the the least exertive things that you can do. Just get between seven and nine hours sleep every night and I guarantee you it will make a huge difference in your life. Why? Because when we sleep, our body is able to recover. Uh, Our heart rate slows down. Therefore, there's a reduction in anxiety. Um, It allows our central nervous system to chill out. It has really positive implications for brain recuperation. I know there's been research done that have speculated that age-related health problems such as Alzheimer's can actually be linked back to uh, a lack of sleep because as we sleep, our brains... I don't know if they heal, but our brains are able to kind of replenish replenish themselves. And if we don't get enough sleep, our bodies go into a deficit and it doesn't make it back until we've caught up on the sleep that we've caught up on. So you may get five hours of sleep one night. If you don't then make up for that two or three hours, five, six, seven, yeah, that two or three hours that you've missed – You are going to maintain that deficit. It's kind of like when you withdraw from the bank. If you don't deposit money into the bank, but you constantly take it out, eventually you're going to end up with no money. And that's the same with sleep. If you're constantly not getting enough sleep, over time that accumulates and you end up with drops in moods, more more prone to depression and anxiety. It becomes harder to control the hunger response. So I know that there's some people that I support who are in my Fearless Movement crew who have had challenges with eating and it becomes much harder to exercise self-control when it comes to snacking when you're a bit tired because everything's everything and I, I know from experience with lack of sleep that it becomes harder to do a lot of things when you're fatigued our brains don't function the same way you're more irritable yeah in general if you can get between seven and nine hours sleep it will definitely make a change in your life Now, you may be also wondering, since I've suggested these few things for you, if you're doing the moves right. And I know that that can be something that's really challenging and it's something that my crew, it was why I'm here to support them for, um, they will often ask me. It's like, I've just started a new move, but I'm not sure if I'm doing it right. Well, if that is the case, what you can do is download a movement guide that I have written that is specifically designed to support people who chest blind but also people who spend long times sitting and not only does it have a breakdown of the bretzel in it it's got breakdowns on how to do deep breathing exercises as well now it's totally free i will link to the movement guide in the show notes as well and you can just jump in and download a copy of that go ahead have a read through and start to learn what little changes you can make today that are going to make a big difference in your life. So let's recap what I've talked about today. We've gone over what it means to transition, uh, using physical activity to support your needs and your medical or non-medical transitions. We've given you not just one, but three things that you can do right now. Don't forget to grab a copy of our movement guide. You can download that. Again, links will be in the show notes. You can find all the details of what we've gone over today in the show notes as well. So if you want to find out more about us or get in contact, you can go to www.fearlessmovement.co. You can find us on Facebook under Fearless Movement Collective, or you can find me on Insta under the No T and B. 
I will link all of those details in the show notes as well. Uh, And until next week, remember, you are super rad, amazing, and a totally badass human. There is no one else like you, and you freaking rock at being you. Have a rad-ass day, pals.